two, and let's talk about Moses. Lesson four this morning is Moses, and uh, we're going to take it from a a real different. Um, uh, Direction that the Lord has been putting on my heart all week. And I believe it will be a blessing to us as we move into chapter 2 of Exodus, second, Bible, uh, second uh, book in the Bible. And we're going to read from uh, 11 on through uh, chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> so, it says in chapter 2, verse 11, One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to the people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the, one, to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your, comp strike your companion? And he answered, Who made you a prince and a judge over? Over us. Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But, Mo but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water with, uh, with their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away. But Moses stood up and saved them and watered their flock. When they came home to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew water for us and watered the flock. And he said to his daughters, Then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter Zippor. She gave birth to a son. He called his name Gershom, for, the, for he said, I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because their slavery had cried out for help. Excuse me. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard them groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And we'll stop there. Now, this is a very interesting way to introduce Moses because what we're going to look at today is within this chapter, Moses goes from Pharaoh's house, being raised in the Egyptian royal family, if you will, to now going out to the desert. Now, notice, too, that in our story this morning, the women at the well said that he was from where? Not a Hebrew, not a Jew, but that he was an Egyptian. So he, he still had the remnant of Egypt that was oozing out of him, or they would not have classified or qualified him as an Egyptian. Now, imagine this, because imagine, where did he come from? Egypt. Where did he live? In Pharaoh's house. So he's part of the royal family, although adopted in, but he was considered to be actually part of their bloodline as far as they were concerned. And listen, Pharaoh's house represented a couple things. Number one, it represented privilege. He lived a privileged life. He was a privileged kid growing up. He was one of those kind of, you know, might have been one of those kind of rich, snooty kids that had everything given to him. He was a person of status. The Pharaoh's house was a status symbol. And so he was growing up not only privileged, but he grew up with status. He grew up with a great amount of wealth around him. He had uh, probably an unlimited bank account that he could tap into had he needed anything. Pharaoh's house also represented power. It was the, the power structure of Egypt. It was where Egypt was ruled from. And he lived in that house. He was also living in a house of prestige. Not just in Egypt, but around the world. People knew the pharaohs, and they knew what the household represented. And lastly, he would have been able to have a high education. Living in Pharaoh's house meant he was very well educated. He was very well versed, not just on uh, Egyptian ways, but on the ways of the world. And so here we meet him, and guess what? 
He's not a young kid. He's 40 years old. He's 40 years old, and he's going out from the place or a palace where he dwelt, and now he's going into the desert. Why is he going there? Why is he going? Well, he murdered somebody, and somebody dimed him out. No, that's not why he went there. I submit to you that the reason that Moses left the palace and came into the desert is because that's where God was going to school him on what God's plans and purposes were for his life. Matter of fact, you see, it is God's schooling takes place not in the church, but in the wilderness. I further submit to you this morning that the desert is where God schools us if we're going to live the, the, the Christian life. Has anybody ever been in the wilderness? Has anybody testify that they've been in the desert? I don't know about you, but I'm an alumni of this school. Matter of fact, they keep asking me back in. God keeps asking me to come, and I'm not even a special speaker. I'm still a student there. You see, I know that many times I've had to go back into the school of the desert, of the wilderness, as a refresher course in my life. And every time that I've gone into the desert, every time I've gone into the wilderness, God speaks something new to me. God speaks something fresh to me. He gives me clearer vision. He gives me clearer understanding. And here's the thing. Everybody lean in because this is a great secret. Every time I go into the desert, something inside of me dies. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. And by the way, if something inside of you doesn't die, you're going to stay there a lot longer. Oh, yeah. Just read the children of Israel. Four-day journey took 40 years. Why? Because they wouldn't let things die. How do I know? They kept longing for Egypt. They kept longing for the old. They kept longing for the old. And, and what's, what's happening here is Moses is being taken out to God's school or to his university, and it's located in the desert. No, it's not Phoenix, Arizona, and it's not Las Vegas. It's a real barren place. I speak of a barren campus that has no dormitories, has no library, and it does not have the comforts of this world. That's right talking about a place it's a barren campus that God will take all of his children to and he, they will experience and they will either hear God or like the children of Israel they will reject God you see this university in the desert is a place that has a lot of craggy rocks it has a lot of sand it's overbearing with heat and there's one thing for sure that the wilderness offers and it's loneliness one thing for sure that the, 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 the wilderness will offer you is loneliness. Now, some might stay for weeks there. Some might stay for months there. But not Moses. Nope. God's going to do it up good. He's going to keep them there for 40 years. 40. Capital F, capital O, capital R, capital T, capital Y. 40 years. That's a long time. Now remember, there, I'm going to tell you why I believe God put him there for 40 years. I believe for every year that he was in Egypt, God had to work out of him Egypt. In order for God to work into him what he had for him, he had to work out of him what was so ingrained within him. And that was the way of Egypt. Somebody getting this this morning? Here's the thing. Here's the secret about the desert. And this is what I love. God showed me this this week and I started laughing. I did. I started laughing. I said, God, you're just too good. You're too, you're too funny too. Get this. In the Hebrew, the word desert is midbar. M-I-D-B-A-A-R. Midbar. And it comes from the word or the root word da-bar. And you know what it means? You know what the word desert means in Hebrew? It means to speak. The word desert in the Hebrew means to speak. Now, if there's a place that God's going to speak to you, I guarantee you it's going to be in the desert. It's in this place, the desert, that God delights in speaking to us. It's only if we're willing to hear him there. Because most of us, when we get to the desert, when we get to the wilderness, what do we do? We do what the children of Israel do. We complain. We murmur. 
It's too hot. It's too lonely. This hurts. It's too long of a journey. Oh, God, where are you? And all along, God's got all these markers that he's showing you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Matter of fact, he was with them so much that as they grew, as their children grew, the Bible says their clothes grew with them. They never, ever outgrew their clothes, their shoes, or anything. The Bible says that they, they didn't even go without food or drink. God provided them. And he provides them with a, a cloud during the, the daytime, which is the Holy Spirit to lead them, to, so that the sun wouldn't beat on them so much. And then at night, when it, get, when it gets cold in the desert, he gives them a pillar of fire, which is still the Holy Spirit, to keep Keep them warm. And yet they're complaining. They're murmuring. I think we need more murmuring in the church, don't you? I think we need a little bit more murmuring in the church. No, we don't. Trust me, from my standpoint, we do not need any more murmuring. <laughs> it is here in the desert that he communicates some of the most important things to us. It's not in the mountaintop. It's not when everything's going good. I'll tell you when he speaks the most to me. It's when I'm in the most lonely place, when it's the driest, when it is the hottest, when it is the most difficult place to walk through. That's when God speaks to me the most. You see, it is here that Moses finds himself in a lonely place. If you find yourself in a lonely place right now, that means God's either speaking to you or getting ready to speak to you some very wonderful things. May God not just open up our eyes, but may he open up our ears. And let me tell you something that should happen. Some of us spiritually need to take the cotton out of our ears and put it in our mouth. I'll say it again. Some of us spiritually need to take the cotton out of our ears and put it in our mouth so that we talk less and listen more. That's why we got two of these and one of these. But this thing gets me in a lot more trouble than this does. Oh, yeah. Amen. Matter of fact, if I did more of this, I would do less of this. And if I did more of this, I'd probably be in a lot better shape. Some of us need to take that spiritual cotton out of our ears and put it in our spiritual mouths and shut up and listen. You say, oh, you said shut up. My kid's in here. Uh, well, let me say it again. Shut up and listen. All right. It's a place here in this wilderness that God unfolds his plans and his purposes for Moses' life. Not only for Moses, but for the people of God, too. You see, it's in this lonely place, in this desert place, that God begins to, to do something in Moses. And it's the same thing he does in us. You see, it's here that one finds themselves stripped of all the things that they hung on to for comfort in the past. You see, here it's no longer, you know, sometimes it's relationships. I'm at the stage of my life where people are, who, who have had influence in my life are dying. I'm at the stage of my life that, that people that have had huge influence and in mentoring in my life are dying. My mom and dad, they're gone. My mentor died two weeks ago. I'll be doing his memorial service in two weeks. My mentor died, and, and, and I, when I got the call two Sundays ago, I, I was sitting there, and my, my wife, I just sat down, and I just went, and she said, what was that? And I told her, and she said, oh, honey. I said, I know. I said, it just seems like, and everywhere around me, the Lord is taking away my props. People that have propped me up, people that have mentored me. People who have spoken into my life, who have believed in me when I couldn't see what I had inside of me, they did. And so we're at the stage, just like Joshua, I, I understand what Joshua was feeling in Joshua 1. We spent so much time there in the winter and in the early spring that my mentor's gone. I can't, I can't keep thinking about, I can think about what he taught me, but I can't keep, I can't keep my eyes on that. I got to keep moving forward. And so sometimes it's, it's these things that are comfortable in our lives that, 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 that will be removed and things in our lives. And this is what was going on in Moses. God was massaging out of him and ripping out of him at times Egypt so that he could put into him what was God's plan and purpose for his life. So my question to you this morning, is there anything that you're hanging on to? 
We talked Wednesday that Jesus said something very important to us about the end times. He said, remember Lot's wife. If you remember anything, I feel like Jesus was saying, if there's anything that I told you about the end times, hear me in this. Remember Lot's wife. And a God-fearing Jew, or any Jew, would know the story of Lot's wife. And really, not just any Jew, but most people on the face of the earth would have known the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened to Lot's wife. Lot's wife represents, I submit to you, he, that she represents to us that there is something inside of our hearts that really longs for the things of this world that needs to be crucified. Because if there's anything that would cause us, now imagine this, I mean this is, I mean we laugh at this but we're human and we know that we're just like her in many ways. Get this, God is, he is bringing, I mean he's really ticked off at Sodom and Gomorrah. And he's not just judging them, he's doing it with fire and brimstone. By the way, secret, oh I, I hate to be a spoiler alert, he's going to do the same thing at the end of all time. Okay, read the book of Revelation, read Daniel, read Ezekiel. He is going to rain fire and brimstone upon the earth once again. How do I know? Because he said, I'll never do it by flood. There may be floods, but I will never flood the whole earth like I did with Noah. What I will do next time is fire. I'm going to bring fire, and I'm going to bring hail, and I'm going to bring uh, uh, brimstone. How would you like to be around for that? Well, fortunately, we probably won't be here for that piece. But here's the thing. He says, remember Lot's wife. Why? Sodom and Gomorrah, the angel, God sends angels to take them out. They're, they're way outside the city now. And all of a sudden, hell, fire, and brimstone. And the angel says, don't look back. Don't let there be any remnant of Sodom and Gomorrah in your heart. Because if you do, you'll be judged. And as soon as she does look back, she turns to a pillar of salt. What's the Lord saying there? I believe several things. One, don't put your hand in the plow and look back. Because you're not fit for my kingdom, Jesus said. I didn't say that. I'm quoting him. I'm quoting the author. Those are his words, patented and everything. But most importantly, he's saying, don't let there be anything in your heart that will be so attached to today's world that if I were to come, you would say, wait a minute. I can't go right now. This is too important. And can I say something to you? That means your kids your spouse, your job, your success, everything you have. But God, I was just getting ready to get promoted. Doesn't matter. Is that more important to you than being really promoted? What's going on here? Is there anything in your heart? Because you see, the wilderness experience will expose that to you. And that's what God was doing for Moses. He was taking Egypt out of him and Pharaoh out of his heart and life. And he was forever changing Moses' plans, purposes, and directions. Many believe, many scholars believe that, that Moses would have been second that he would have been the new Pharaoh had Pharaoh died. Even, even jumping over Pharaoh's blood son. But now what is God doing? He says, instead of making you a leader of one nation called Egypt, I'm going to lead you for a nation called my nation, Israel, Jacob. Take them out and they're going to be the greatest nation on the face of the earth. It is here in this desert that we must never forget that God is ready to speak to us. Now here are some thoughts today in our Sunday school lesson that we're calling Wilderness 101. Welcome to class. Wilderness 101. First of all, I can tell you as I've already stated, isolation will always be a part of this class. If you're going to be taking Wilderness 101, 102, or 201, or 202, I can guarantee you loneliness will be a part of that. God assigns your desert and, your, and he ushers you there. It's kind of like this. You arrive to Wilderness University. You, you arrive to the Wilderness University and your father, God, drops you off there. Now, if you're a parent like the Bissells or the Austins who have recently just dropped off a student to college, what happened, Andrew? They left you in Boston. Now, as much as mommy wants to stay there with you, and still do the mommy thing. 
a little bit more of that apron string was cut. And at one point in time, when they dropped you off, when the Austins dropped their son off, you have to leave. You can't stay there. Matter of fact, there's some colleges that have now fences where you drop your kid off and you have to let them go in so that there's a barrier there so that you don't go, give me my Johnny back. <laughs> okay? So what happens here, and by the way, when I went to school, way back in 1984, when I went back to school, or went to school, college, I went 1,200 miles away from home. And that's not because I wanted to get away from home so much. It was because where God called me. And so I'm studying at, this, at the college. My, my sister and my brother-in-law took me from Detroit down to Florida because they had come up and driven up to be with the family in, in the uh, first of August. And I had to be down for the third week of August. So they lived down there. So they took me down. So I had to say goodbye to my parents. I said goodbye to my parents, my family. And I ended up going to Lakeland, Florida to go to college there at the university to study for the ministry. And my sister dropped me off on a Saturday and said goodbye, and I was alone. I was 1,200 miles away from home. As beautiful as the presence of God was on that campus, and there was all Christians around me, th there was some loneliness there. I felt isolated. I never met my, my roommate until that day. I never, I didn't know the campus layout. There was a lot that I had to learn. And so like parents who drop off their kids at school, here's Father God dropping off Moses in the Wilderness University. And by the way, he's the only student. <laughs> he's all alone. He, don't even, he doesn't even have a roommate. He doesn't even have companionship. And don't tell me sheep are companions because they're not. Standing in the midst of the campus, you he, he feel alone. You question, why? Why am I all alone? Why can't my parents stay? But then all of a sudden, guess what happened to me? I think it was about October. I get a knock on my dorm door, and guess what happened to me? Surprise, not my mom and dad. No, not my sister. A care package. It's one of those packages that came in, and it had everything I liked at the time. And even some new pants, and my mom got me some new stuff and put it in a box. It was sent, you know, by a snail mail, and it took a couple weeks to get there. But I had a care package. And that's what God will do. He'll leave you out there, and then all of a sudden, he's going to show, show up, and he's going to give you a care package or two. You see, it's a lonely place. It can be a lonely place of pain. It can be that campus in the wilderness can be just like, man, what, what did I sign up for? But I want you to, to listen to these words in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 10. This is God speaking about taking Jacob or Israel out into the desert. He says this, he found, God found him, Israel, in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He, God, encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. Get this. These, there, there are four campus observations from that scripture. First, God sees you there. Not only does he know that you're there, but he sees that you're there. He keeps his eye on you. And then God encircles you in that campus with his own presence. Moses may have physically felt alone, but there was a presence there that was greater than his whole family could have made up. And it was the presence of God. The third observation from that scripture that I just read is that God cares for you while you're there. He'll take care of your every need while you're in that wilderness. And then lastly, you don't lose your place as the apple of his eye. You never lose your value. Just because you're in Wilderness University and you're on the most lonely campus of the entire world. And for some reason, when you wake up Saturday morning on that campus, there is no bonfire there's no campus football game going on. There's nothing to look forward to but another dry and hot, lonely day. How would you like to go to that university? No parties there. Don't have to worry about your kid getting drunk on jello shots there. No. This is a campus that goes deeper. It works from the inside out. You see, you will never lose your value when you go through that campus. God will never abandon you. He'll never forsaken you. He will walk you through the wilderness campus. 
And if that's not enough, listen to the rest of this. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 11 through 12, Like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on pinions, the Lord alone guided him, who? Israel, through their journey. No foreign god was with them. You see, God will guide you through this campus. He will guide you through this experience. You may not feel him. You may not always hear him. But I can tell you one thing. He's there for you. Amen. All right, you might, he, although desert means it's a place where God speaks, he may only speak once in a while, but when he does speak, it's going to be very relevant because the very first time that God speaks to Moses is when he gets Moses' attention from a burning bush. There's a bush that's burning but not being consumed. Moses is curious to it. Now, but, now understand this. Moses did not have necessarily a Jewish background in the sense of learning. And so when God calls him by letting this bush burn, God's bringing him near. And Moses as well, what's going on here? And then all of a sudden, out from the bush, never has he heard this before. Guess what's happening? God speaks. And God begins to define the plan that he has for Moses. Now, you know you're busy when a bush is burning and not consumed, and as soon as you get close to it, for the first time, you hear a booming voice that you've never heard before. You know you're busy at that point. And my guess, well, we know. Did you know right after he speaks to him, he's got a homework assignment. He's got a homework assignment. And it's a pretty big homework assignment. He's got to go back into Egypt eventually, and, t and convince millions of people that he is there to take them out of that land and deliver them. Now that's quite an assignment. I just got the book for my, my semester, for my master's degree. I'm doing a master's in theology, and, and I just got my book yesterday in my assignment. My, and I'm smiling as I'm reading it, and I'm reading it, and my wife goes, you went from smiling to looking like, oh my word. Yeah, it's going to take me three months to do it and I'm glad they gave it to me for three months it's going to take all of that and on top of that I got to write two 5,000 word papers God bless you. Yeah. and that's just one course Moses' campus was a campus that was in the shadow of Mount Sinai it might have had a beautiful view but he was all alone. There was the very mountain that God would eventually have him bring the people of Israel out into. And it was the very mountain that God wanted to speak not only to Moses, but eventually to the whole nation. And so this campus that Moses found himself became his new home. And it was the place where he would learn one thing that would change his entire life. And what is that one thing? Well, you have to wait until next week. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Turn to Exodus chapter 33. The one thing that I believe that God worked out of Moses was the things of Egypt and Pharaoh. But what he worked into him was of greater value than we And it's the same thing that God wants to work into us. Look at verse 1 of chapter 33, first three verses. The Lord said to Moses... Depart, go up from here, and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Persiasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. How many of you take that? How many of you love that? Isn't that cool? But look at verse 3. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go up with you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. Then look at verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. 
Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order, in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this, is a na this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring me up from here. What was it that he learned in that desert? It's the most important thing. Not how to lead people out of Egypt, but how to hear from God. And how to know one thing. You see, listen, here, here's what's happening here. God's angry with the people. And they're so stiff-necked and so rebellious. And they're so not dealing with their sin issues that God says to them, I'm going to let you go in because I'm not a man that I would lie. I made a promise to you. And I made a promise that you would go into a land and inherit it. I will never back away from my promise. That's why the scripture says that the gifts of God are without repentance. Because when God gifts somebody, he gifts it. He doesn't take it back. He's not someone who gives you a gift receipt with his gifts. He doesn't. He just is waiting for you to line up with his will and listen to his voice so he can use that gift that he's given you for his kingdom glory. But here's the thing. These people were so stiff-necked, they would not repent. They would not turn from their ways. They still wanted to go to Egypt. But he says, I'm going to take you into the promised land. Moses, I'm going to give you everything I said I would give you. And I'm going to give it to you because you found favor with me. But I'm going to give you angels. They're going to go in. They're going to conquer your enemies. They're going to, they're going to conquer you, the demons that are going before you. They're going to do spiritual warfare on your behalf. And I'm going to give you, and it's going to be a land flowing with milk and honey. And it's going to be a place where you're going to thrive. And it's going to be a place where you're going to grow. But I will not be there. And I will not let my presence go with you because these people are so stiff-necked. If I go with them, I will consume them because they won't repent and they won't turn. But I'm still going to bless you. I'm still going to let you know that I have kept my word and I've kept my promise. But my presence is not going with you. And Moses says, if you're not going, I don't want to go either how many would take that deal man we get to go in still we still get to get all the spiritual blessings that God promised us we still get to have that land flowing with milk and honey matter of fact all the the Jebusites the Gergesites and all the sites that are in there they're all going to be dispelled by the angels of God Man, I'm going to take that deal right now. Really? You'll take it? Because Moses learned one thing in 40 years in the desert being alone with God. He learned one thing. He said, you know what? If your presence isn't with me, it ain't worth it. You can have the most successful marriage. You can have the most successful business. You can have the most successful kids. You can have the most successful anything in life. But if God's presence isn't in it, it's worthless. Amen. Amen. He learned one thing. He learned that if it wasn't for God's presence in my life, I've got nothing. Amen. Man, I could succeed. I can bring this people into the land and I will be the greatest among all the people. And people will shout my praises and will talk about me for generations. And they still do anyway. But he could have gone in. He could have inherited it. He could have gone in and seen it for himself. But guess what? He said, if your presence isn't taking me in, I'm not going. And what would happen if the body of Christ, I'm going down, if the body of Christ said, I will not move one iota if your presence isn't with me. I told you some weeks ago when I was pastoring an onset, on a Wednesday night I said that the Lord challenged me and said, say to the people, what would happen if most churches if, if I removed my spirit from church, would they know that my Holy Spirit's not even there? Because the Lord showed me that there are churches that they are doing things, and they might even be doing things in His name, but the presence, not His everywhere presence, His manifested presence, the blessing of His glory, where is manifested among them, that there are people who will do things in the name of Jesus or in God's name but don't have the spirit of God with them how is that possible well we see it all the time we see organizations outside the body of Christ that are doing things that the body of Christ should be doing with his presence and with his anointing that we're not doing we see organizations going all over the country right now trying to help places that have been hit by hurricanes that don't have Jesus with them but they're doing a good work 
You can do a good work all in the flesh. You can do it all with your own ideas. But if his presence isn't with you, it's meaningless. You don't get credit because it looks like Jesus. Because it looks, hey, the Bible says to do it. They're doing what the Bible said to do. But if they don't have his presence, it's meaningless. Just like you can't get into heaven without his presence. You can't get into heaven without being born again. You can do all the good works in the world. You can give, as, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 13, your body to the flames. You can go down and you can go to Houston and then go into Naples, Florida, and then go to Puerto Rico. You can rebuild the Virgin Islands all on your own and make it more beautiful than it was three weeks ago. But if you don't have God in your life and you don't have the presence of the Lord and you're not born again, you ain't getting into heaven. I don't care how good you are. I don't care what you've done in your name or in the name of a church. If his presence isn't with us, I want to go nowhere. I get asked all the time. People ask me, people ask me, you know, my, my, my in-laws have asked me, why don't you come to Florida, bring, bring the family down, the whole family can be together, because the Lord's not telling me to go. Oh, I could go and be successful down there, but if his presence isn't leading me there, it's worthless. Right. Even, even in, in, in pastor, pastorates with churches have said, would you come and be our pastor? I've said, no, why? Because the Lord's not leading me there. He's, he told me to stay here. And if his presence isn't leading me, I'm not going. Even at my job. Would you, would you like to do this? Not unless God's telling me to do it. Why? Because if his presence isn't with me, I don't want to go. I can tell you one thing that was worked into Moses' life, which was the most important thing, was he knew the voice of God. And if God was not going to be with him, he did not want anything to do with it. Even if it meant inheriting the promises of God. Think about how deep that is. We have a church today that's preaching that you need to be blessed right now. And if you're not blessed, you're in sin. If you're not blessed, you're not obtaining everything God has for you. If you're not blessed, listen, I'm blessed. You see, your definition of blessed and my definition of blessed might be different. And they probably are. For me, having clothes, something to eat, having a place to sleep, and having a car that runs, and having a family, that's what I'm blessed with. Now, some think that if I don't have a bank account that's really large, and I don't have a really nice car, and I don't have the fanciest houses, then somehow I'm not tapping into all that God has for me. Let me tell you something. All that God's given me is way beyond what I deserve. I don't deserve what I have. But I can tell you that when we moved, when we moved from Detroit to here, when we moved to, from New Bedford to Bourne, from Bourne back to New Bedford, we did not move until we knew that the Lord was telling us to do so. Because to move prematurely means that you're getting ahead of God and you're doing it without God. And if there's one thing that the wilderness will teach you is that when you're out there and it's hot and you're lonely and God begins to speak to you, what you want to do when you come out of the wilderness is you want to know, you know what, I am not going anywhere unless I hear the voice of God telling me to go. Amen. And let me tell you what happens. Can I go really deep here? This is going to probably be deep scaling for either people here or on video. But you know what? We got too many people who are putting God into their lives and telling God, this is how you're going to bless me. And then when he doesn't do it the way that they tell him to, then they get mad and they walk away from him. And then we got people who are getting married to people who aren't even in the church. But God's telling me to marry them because we're in love. No, you're in heat. And you're in love. And God says, don't marry an unbeliever. But we believe it's a way of, of evangelizing now. <laughs> And then we've got, no, I'm serious. I can tell you uh, currently, not here in this church, I can tell you of at least three marriages I know where the believer, strong in the Lord, married non-believers, and now three, four, five years later, their marriages are shipwrecked, and it's all because the other one does not want to go to church, does not want to follow the ways of the Lord, does not want anything to do with Christianity or their form of it. But we, 
we, we put God in our lives and say, you will bless this thing because we are in love. And because we got married in a church, we're going to be blessed and happy. Come on, Pastor. Come on. And that is why you've heard me say this a hundred times. When I do pre-marriage counseling, my first question is, why do you want to get married? And when they say, because we're in love, I say, well, I can't marry you. Yeah. What? I cannot marry you. I've done this with couples, and they've taken two or three sessions before they've come back and say, why won't you marry us? We're in love. Look at us. Look how close we are. We've been dating for three and a half weeks, and come on, look, we're in love. <laughs> Why won't you marry us? We're Christians. We love each other. Come on. And I'll say, still can't. It's not good enough. <gasps> What's not good enough? Oh, blast me. We'll go find somebody else. And they do. And then they end up shipwrecked. And then they come to me for counseling. <laughs> why, why would you come to the guy that you don't want to marry? And they'll say, so why didn't you want to marry us? I said, because you never told me it was because what God spoke to you. That, that was the right thing to do. You say, why is that important? Because when you get married, I've got a secret for you, you millennials. When you get married, after the honeymoon, things happen. <laughs> and sometimes they happen and they don't feel like a honeymoon. Yep. Come on. Sometimes when you say, till death do us part, you're thinking, how long is death going to take? <laughs> <laughs> You see, even in Christian marriages, you go through stuff. And don't tell me you don't, because if you don't, then you're lying. And if you're lying, now you've sinned. Yeah. Come on. Come on. And so when they come to me or they come to a leader for, pre, or for, for counseling from their marriage, I always say to them, when they start saying, well, we're not sure we want to continue, uh, I say, wait a minute. You said that God spoke to you. Did he change his mind? No. Because you got to know what, you got to believe what God spoke to you in the darkness when He spoke to you in the light. So, when He spoke to you in the light when you were in love and you were all mushy and gushy and, oh, we're in love and God's telling us to get married, huh? that when it gets hard, you can go back and say, the reason we're sticking it out is because God said that we're supposed to be married. We didn't get married just out of love, we got married because God's presence. See, here's the thing. God said something many years ago through, to, through a mentor of mine to me. He said, you know, a lot of people, almost everybody invites God to their wedding ceremony, but very few invite them into the marriage, him into their marriage. Every, God's always invited to most marriage ceremonies. He's, he's invited somehow. But what about, the, what about the marriage? And we got people making decisions. We got people moving around. We got people getting jobs, quitting jobs, doing this, buying that, all saying God told them, and then all of a sudden they can't afford it. They, they, it's a, and that job stinks, and they don't know what to do, and they just moved, and they did all this, and they got married, and now things are caving in. What's going on? And God says, man, I, I never said to do that. We blame God for a lot of things. And we give ourselves permission to do a lot of things in his name. That hurts. We make a lot of decisions to say, you know what God said. Okay. God changed his mind three weeks later. I used to not challenge people when they were leaving churches, this church or other churches. And now I challenge them. You told me three years ago that God said this, that this was going to be your, your, your home church and that God sent you here. Yeah, but, but now he's, he's telling me to go somewhere else. Really, why? I don't know. Yeah, neither do you. I do. I tell him. Neither do you. You don't have a clue why you're leaving. You think it's God. But we're just the seventh church that you've left in your church life. And there will be an eighth one. There will be a ninth one until you literally hear from God. And you know that God is going to want you to bloom where you're planted. I challenge people now. Let's try to keep them. To try to speak into their lives. I've had people outside this church who've left their, their church and they said, oh, can we come to your church? And I said, why did you leave your church? Well, you know, how long were you there? Oh, about four years. Oh, how'd you get there? Well, God sp spoke to us to be there. Da, 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 da. And what's he speaking now? Well, I, I just feel like he wants us to leave there. Why? I don't know. I just feel like he wants us to leave. But don't come to our church. Either go back to yours or find another church you can leave. I do. I've told people not to come here. You say, oh, pastor, no wonder we're not growing. You see... I want organic growth. I don't want transfer growth. I don't want some other pastor's problem. I want God's problem to come in here. 
I want people who have never been church, who are so dysfunctional that when they come in here, they, they don't know church decorum. They don't know how to act in church. <laughs> That's the people I want. I want organic growth. I want new growth. I want people who have never committed themselves to the Lord to come in here, flop themselves down in the front row thinking that this is a movie theater, and then find God. That's who I want. I don't want people coming in here. Yeah, that's what I want. I want organic growth. I don't want people coming in here from other churches who think that that, you know, then they bring that, well, this is all we did in our church. Well, you're out there. Go back if that's how you did it and you like it. Go. There's two doors, two exit ways, and then there's one here. Please digress. <laughs> right? Come on. But you know what? We do things without God's presence all the time. And the Lord this week, I was praying, I think it was Tuesday, and I, I don't just pray on Tuesdays, I pray every day, but I was praying and I just began to cry out and I said, Lord, I don't want anything in my life that doesn't come with your presence. I don't want anything. I don't want any relationship. I don't want anything in my job, anything in my home, anything for this church. If it's not your presence leading us and guiding us, I don't want it. If your presence isn't going with me and going with us as a home, with us as a church, I don't want it. Don't give me my way. I want you. And what Moses learned, which was the most important thing that I believe the Lord stripped him of, is don't listen to Pharaoh's voice. Don't listen to the education you got in, in, in Egypt. Don't listen to what you've been told don't listen. I'm going to strip all that down so that when you and I have a relationship, Moses, it's going to be mano y mano, you and me. And I want you to be so attuned to my voice and so aware of my presence that you will not want to go anywhere without me. And then later when he's given the opportunity, which I believe was a test from the Lord, not a temptation, a test. He was testing Moses to see, did you learn what I taught you? in Wilderness University. Did you hear? Do you know? And let me say something to you. If you are going to make a decision in life that's major, you don't need my blessing. You don't need this church's blessing. You don't need any Christian's blessing. What you need is the presence of the Lord. If you don't have His manifested presence, I'm not talking about His everywhere presence. I'm talking about His manifested presence where it is intimate where it's a relationship, it's intimate, and you hear his voice. If you are going to tell me that God is speaking to you, then I'm going to believe that you learned how to hear that voice in wilderness experiences, that you learned in the Wilderness University how to come to that place where nothing else matters, but I have to follow the Lord. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death when it came to the grounds of this land that he was fighting for. And I say, give me your presence or let me die. Seriously. Lord, don't withhold your presence from me. You know why? You say, well, the pastor, that's a pretty strong prayer. Well, then read Psalm 51 when David said, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do whatever you got to do to punish me for the sin of killing off Uriah, of, of, of committing adultery, of all this stuff I did. Do what you got to do, but don't take your presence from me. You can take everything else, but don't take your presence from me. Because if you take your presence from me, I'll die anyway. And if we got so desperate, and I wonder if the church is even close to this, that we would get so desperate that we would say, God, unless you're going to go with me, I don't want to go. If I don't have your presence, I'd rather just die now. Because if your presence isn't with me, this life means nothing. When you get to that desperate place, that's when God says, now watch what I'll do. Now see what I'll do with this life. You know, we, the, the Lord has put on my heart that, that, that I need to pray for my life, for my family's life, and for the life of this church, that we will have the fear of God again. That we will fear God, not in being afraid of Him, but that we will have a fear of God that will say, you know what? 
God is so holy, so magnificent, so powerful, and he is so wonderful that if I don't have him in my life, and if I don't have him manifesting in my life, then, I, then, then something's wrong with me. Not with him. Something's wrong here. And i got to figure that out. So help me, God, because I don't want anything that will keep me from having all of you. And that's why I was praying this morning. Yes, let us be shackled to, if there's going to be anything I'm shackled to, let it be your love and your presence. Let it be who you are. Let nothing in my heart be shackled to the old ways of thinking, the old ways of doing. But let me be, let me be a bondservant of Christ, as Paul said. Let me be shackled with him so that when he moves, I move. Not when I move, he moves with me. But that when he moves, I move. That when he leads, I follow. That when I'm shackled to Jesus as a bondservant, that I stay in place until he says, let's go, son. And I don't say, come on, let's go, Jesus. And try dragging him along with me. And say, because I'm a bondservant, Jesus says it's okay to do this. And he's going, I don't even say that. I never said that. And he's trying to get you back. And you're kicking and screaming, hanging on to Egypt and the world and that thing in your life. But Jesus, come on, really? It's kind of like your kid. You know, you, I'm sure he's of that age still. My grandson's that age. No, no, come on. Got to redirect. Right? But just because I'm 51 doesn't mean that God doesn't do that to me. No, come on. <laughs> Let's redirect, Eric. <laughs> Let's redirect. You're going off over here. And don't tell me he's not trying to do that with you. Because he's trying to. So what is the lesson? Well, first let me give you the memory verse. The memory verse is found in Exodus 33, verse 15. It says, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring me up from here. That is your memory verse. But what is he teaching us through Moses in our Sunday school lesson? Well, that there's a, there's a university that we all have to sign up for and be willing to go to. It's called the Wilderness University. It's in the desert. And it's in the desert where God will speak to us. And if he'll speak to us in the desert and we'll listen to his voice and we learn to cultivate obedience by listening to his voice and only moving when he's moving, then we will get to the point that Moses got to in, in his journey of life and, journey, and leading other people is that I will not go anywhere that your presence will not take me. I won't go anywhere. I'm not talking about lunch. Well, Lord, should I go to Smoky Bones or to Olive Garden? Where are you at today? <laughs> no, he's not going to be, you know, he might change you up and say, hey, listen. But if you know his voice and he has an encounter for you at Olive Garden and you want to go to Smoky Bones, and he says, go to Olive Garden. And you go, you're obedient. But you don't have to walk out of here today going, you know, Domino's, Papa Gino's, Baldi's. Or Little Caesars. Lord, what pizza does your presence descend upon? No, you don't have to do that. There are moments, though, in your life while you might be thinking you're going somewhere that the Lord whispers in your heart, go here instead. And that's fine. Just be attuned to that. But when I talk about where he goes, I don't want to go unless he's going there. I'm talking about it could be a relationship you're in. It could be a job that you're seeking. It could be an opportunity you're seeking. It could be something else, totally different. All I'm saying to you is this, is before we start making life decisions, before we start trying to put God into our life instead of letting Him come into us and bring us into the life that He has for us, I would say, may we learn that wherever He goes is where I want to go. And if He's not going, I don't want to be there either. It's just like asking, you know, just saying, God, is this where you want me to is this what you want me to do? Is this where you want me to go? It doesn't mean you have to spend six hours fasting and praying over something. It's as simple as saying, Are you going? Will you meet me here? Many days I'm going to work and, and the Lord, I'll say, Lord, I need your presence. I need you. If you're not here today, 
I'm not going to be able to do anything that's going to amount to anything. And not only that, but even if I do, I, they're going to see me. They're not going to see you. I want them to see you in me, the hope of glory. I'd rather them see you doing it in me and through me than for me to get the credit. You see, I, I don't want to go to work and have my co-workers, the participants, or even people above me see me. I want them to see Christ in me. I want them to say something's different about you and how you do things. And then when they ask, I can say, well, I prayed about it. I say that. I prayed about it. Okay. <laughs> you prayed about it. Yeah, and I just felt led to do. I, I use that terminology. Why? Because I don't want to receive the credit. I'm not, a, I, I'm not that smart. The wisdom that I have comes from God. It doesn't come from me. But you see, I think too often we become, we, 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 we go on, we got to go on um, autopilot in our faith. And we take for granted the wisdom God's given us is his wisdom and we think it's now ours. And we take the credit. And it's not. The breath that I have inside of me didn't come from my mom and dad. It came from God. Every breath that I take is, it's a gift. But I take it for granted so often. And may God restore to us the fear of the Lord. To where we won't move unless he's moving. That we won't go until we know he's going. That we will have the fear of God. And I believe what God instilled in Moses was that fear. Was that awe and that respect of God to the point where he said, God, unless you go with me, I am not going. We seek your presence, Lord. We seek your face that you will fill our hearts with your love and grace. And as we worship you, our hands will raise, draw us afresh, O oh Lord, to your holy place. Lord, would you let us as we seek you, let us find you. You said if we will draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And Lord, some right now might be in the wilderness campus. They might be in that desert place. They may have felt that they were alone or thought they were, or thought that you had forsaken them there, that you just dropped them off there just to come and visit them once in a while. But your word says that you encircle them, that you guide them and care for them and that you have your eye right upon them even as you do the sparrows that fall to the ground and Lord I pray that in this wilderness campus that we might find ourselves in that we will be quick to listen quick to hear what you might be speaking in this classroom so that we might know and we might cultivate in our lives a freshness of what it means to have your manifested presence in us. To only move when you're moving. To only go when you're going. To be still when you are being still. That we will be those, O oh Lord, who will not make life decisions. And we will not even look for the blessing. Instead of the blessing, we'll look to the blesser. Instead of your hand, we want to see your face. Lord, we want your presence in our lives. We need it. And without your presence, Lord, Lord, everything's meaningless. And Moses teaches us that if you're not going into even the blessings that you have for us, and your presence isn't going to be there with us, then we don't want it. So, Lord, what you're teaching us, like you taught Moses, those 40 years in the desert, in the school of the wilderness, in that desert place where you spoke to him truths, where now we have five books of the Bible 
that are, are basically written and were, were uh, spoken out by Moses because of the things that you spoke to him. The Bible says that he was the meekest man on the face of the earth, and that's because he would not take any of the glory for himself. He knew it all re returned back to you. Let it be your presence going with us into our jobs, into our, our homes today. Let your presence be with us, Lord. Let your manifested presence, not, not just your everywhere presence, but your manifested intimate presence become what we need. Let it be the very air that we breathe. Let it be, Lord, like the very air that I breathe right now. Let it be that my need for your presence would be so great, Lord. And Lord, like David said, don't take your presence from me. Lord, you know, you might strip us of everything, but if we have your presence, we still have everything that we ever need. So we pray, Lord, that we will learn that the desert is not a place that is meant for us to die, but a place for us to live by living by the word of God. For the word says that we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So in the desert place, we ask you to let that be a place of life for us as you speak. In Jesus' name, amen.